Hi, I'm Dan. This is about computing with univalence. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, what I mean by computation here. So the framework that we're working in here is something called dependent type theory, which was invented by Per Martin Luff, who's right there. And it's a type theory which is the basis for proof assistance, which are tools for doing formalized math, that is typing in a theorem and the proof of the theorem and getting a computer to check it, and also for programming. And I want to go through one extremely simple example. Let's prove that every natural number is even or odd um, in, so that you get a flavor for what it looks like to do programming and proving independent type theory. So the way that I state that every natural number is even or odd is a program, even or odd, with the following type. OK, so let's parse this. The pi there is what's called a dependent function type, which you want to think of as the analog of for all in logic. So that's saying for all n nat. Either, so there's the disjunction, which is a disjoint union either n is even or n is odd. So how do we say that n is even? Well, we say that by saying there exists a k such that n equals 2 times k. So we say there exists with what's called a sigma type, which you want to think of as the analog of existential quantifier. So there exists a k such that n is 2 times k, or there exists a k such that n is 2k plus 1. And when I say is out loud, I'm using something called the identity type in type theory which you want to think of as the analog of equality in logic. And the cool thing here is that the property of the identity type, the key property of the identity type that we're going to come back to later in the talk, is that identical things are interchangeable in all contexts. So the type theory is set up so that everything you do respects identity. OK. So in this kind of type theory, we identify proofs and programs. So if we want to prove this statement, this logical statement, we do that by writing a program that codifies the kind of, so if you're going to do this from first principles, how would you do it? You'd do it by induction on the natural number. And you'd say, I have a case for 0 where I observe that 0 is even or odd because 0 is even. And then I have a case for 1 plus n where I observe that 1 plus n is even or odd because, well, by the inductive hypothesis, I know that n is even or n is odd. And then if n is even, I flip the bit and say that n plus 1 is odd. Here, odd 1 plus is a lemma that says, given the fact that n is even, n plus 1 is odd, and symmetrically in this case. Okay, So what I'm doing here is codifying just like the inductive argument that we ask people to do in like introductory logic courses here. But what I've also done is not just to prove a theorem, but also to write a program. So I can run this. And the way that I run it, let's say I want to ask, is 3 even or odd, is just by calculating using these equations. So if I ask, is 3 even or odd, it's going to say, well, 3 is not 0. So I end up in this case. I have to ask, is 2 even or odd? By induction, that's going to compute down to saying that 2 is even. And then when you get even here, your result flips the bit and returns odd. So what I'm doing is writing a program that counts down, and then on the way back up, it just says even goes to odd, goes to even, goes to odd. So you're computing the parity of the number. Okay? And in fact, if you zoom in on the type, it's not just computing the parity. It's also computing the integer division, because you're actually coughing up the k such that n equals 2 times k or n equals 2k plus 1. So we're simultaneously writing a proof and a program. Okay? So that's the basic flavor of what proofs look like in dependent type theory. Um, there's a key property that we want to hold for a type theory, which is that we want to be able to interpret our proofs as programs, which means that programs shouldn't get stuck. Whenever I write down a program, if I write down a program that has type nat, that's saying that we should be able to have an algorithm that via a series of computation steps like we had on the last slide, do 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 you get down to an actual numeral. So this is codified by a canonicity theorem, which is a theorem about the type theory, saying that if you have a closed program of type nat, then there's some numeral k such that you can take this complicated program and run it down to a numeral. And this is a constraint on the design of a type theory that we're going to come back to later. OK, so that's just basic dependent type theory. Next thing you need to know about is this homotopy interpretation of type theory. So basically what happened is that over the last while, we've realized that 
there's a correspondence between dependent type theory, like I was talking about on the last couple of slides, and higher dimensional category theory and homotopy theory. So people have given interpretations of Martin Luff's intentional type theory. In homotopy theory, where you interpret types as spaces, so a type is sort of a logical syntactic construction that semantically you think of as a space under this interpretation, or that you interpret as a higher category. And this is the groupoid interpretation of types due to Hoffman and Streicher. Okay, so what does it look like when you do this types as spaces construction? Well, you think of a type as a topological space up to homotopy theory. You think of programs as points in that space. So these are gonna be programs of that type. And then this identity type that we were thinking of as a quality back when we proved that n equals two times k really is general enough to represent paths in this space. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but there's gonna be a introduction to this kind of interpretation of type theory on Tuesday, I think, by Mike Shulman. So we'll put that on the calendar. So if you wanna know more about this, then next Tuesday there's gonna be a talk about it. But for my purposes, what we get out of this, so like, so what? So we have this homotopy interpretation of type theory. What do we get out of it? Well, there's kind of cool applications going in both directions, and in fact, in all three directions. But from if you're a homotopy theorist or a category theorist, what this says is you can use type theory as a logical system for doing proofs in these category theory or homotopy theory semantics. So I write a proof for a program like we were doing for natural numbers on the first slide, and that means something about the math under these interpretations. So that's sort of type theory doing something for homotopy theory. For me as a type theorist, the more important direction for me is that it actually flows back the other way. So the homotopy semantics and the category theory semantics suggest new logical principles to add to the type theory that we hadn't thought of before that make our lives easier. So we're going to sort of go into that in the rest of this talk. Okay, so what is that new principle? Well, it's Voivodsky's univalence axiom is the main one we've considered so far. And the idea with univalence is because we now know that the identity type is general enough to talk about paths in spaces, in particular, you can have paths between things that aren't equal but are somehow equivalent. And what the univalence axiom states is that you can have a type U, which is itself a type of types. Okay, so it's a little bit confusing, but the elements of U are themselves types. And then you take the paths in U, or the equality in U, if you will, to be isomorphism. So you can say you have a type of types where paths are isomorphisms, so for example, if you have a Cartesian product type cross, then you'd have an isomorphism between A cross B cross C and A cross B cross C, okay? And in a sense, we're going to equate these two, except it's not really a quality, it's paths in this homotopy sense, which are gonna turn out to be isomorphisms. And the consequence of this is that because what I said before about the identity type, that identical things are interchangeable in all contexts. The force of this is that now isomorphic types are interchangeable in all contexts, or all constructions in the logical type theory respect isomorphism. Really, I'm cheating here, and the experts know this. It's a notion of weak equivalence, but for my purposes for these 15 minutes, it's okay to think of this as isomorphism. Okay, so just think of it as isomorphism of types. So, What's the force of this? Well, the reason to have a type of types is that you can say that, for example, if you want to define the theory of a monoid inside of type theory, you can say that a monoid is a pair consisting of an element X of U that is a type along with a monoid structure on X. What is a monoid structure? Well, I can write out in the type theory that the type X is equipped with a binary operation, circle dot, x arrow, x arrow, x, a unit u, along with proofs in the type theory that circle dot is associative and that u is a unit for circle dot on the left and the right, okay? So I can write out the theory of a monoid 
inside of the type theory. And that consists of a type X equipped with a monoid structure on, on X. And then you can ask the question, is it the case that if A is isomorphic to B, then can I get from a monoid structure on A to a monoid structure on B? Okay? So if I have an isomorphism on the carrier type of a monoid, are the monoid structures on that identical? And in type theory pre-univalence, the answer is yes, but you have to write it out the hard way by hand. Okay? So you have to do this construction where you say, if I have an isomorphism, so what's an isomorphism? It's F and F inverse along with proofs alpha and beta that F compose F inverse is the identity, F inverse compose F is the identity. Okay? So that's isomorphism. If I have an isomorphism between A and B, and I have a monoid structure circle dot U on A, I want to get a monoid structure on B out of that. Okay, so how do I do this? Well, it's kind of obvious. So if you want to define the multiplica multiplication in B, you do it by taking two elements of B, sending them back over to A by F inverse, doing the multiplication in A, and then sending them back over to B. Okay. Similarly, you send the unit to the image of the unit under the isomorphism, and then you can plug through and check that this, in fact, satisfies the monoid laws. So you do a little calculation where you use the monoid laws for A along with the fact that F and F inverse are actually inverses to show that this does, in fact, form a monoid structure on B. Okay, so I'm going to call this the hard way because we had to write out by hand for this particular monoid structure the way in which the monoid structure respected isomorphism on the carrier set. Okay? So this is what one does in type theory pre-univalence. And the idea with univalence is to make this easier. So instead what we can do in univalent type theory is observe that everything that we can do in type theory without univalence does in fact respect isomorphism. So in this logical theory, all of the constructions respect isomorphism already. And there's witnesses for the fact that they do. You saw an example of that on the previous slide. Right? For that particular monoid structure type, we could already do it. So the point of univalence, in my point of view, is to give a generic name to this principle that everything respects isomorphism, and also to ensure that hypotheses and extensions of the type theory still have this property. So if we want to do things the easy way, then instead of writing the thing on the previous slide where, sorry, let's go back to the previous slide. Instead of writing the thing on the previous slide where I have to make this definition, make this definition, and then do three proofs, I just write one line which says transport monoid stir univalence blah. Okay, so let's dissect that a little bit. Transport is this principle, the proof term, the program that witnesses the fact that identical terms are interchangeable in all contexts. Monoid structures are one such context. So we're saying everything respects identity. Monoid structure is one such thing. Univalence is the principle that isomorphism determines identity. So now given an isomorphism, that determines an identity and therefore monoid structure respects it. So we've deployed this generic idea that everything respects isomorphism in order to get this fact kind of for free with like one line of code instead of having to write it out for the specific case. Okay. So it's important though that um, so like what do we get out of this? Well, if you're doing formalized math you no longer need to prove that each individual thing that you do respects isomorphism. Instead, you have it generically. And if you're doing programming, sometimes in programming we actually want to write down monoids and then like run them to compute an answer by recursion on a tree or something like that. And so we're saying that we can generically derive a monoid on an isomorphic type from one on the type that's isomorphic to it. So we're getting code reuse by what's called a generic program in programming terms. We're writing a program for free by just saying, please transport with univalence. OK, that's the intention anyway. There's a little bit of a rub, which is that in univalent type theory as currently formulated, we can prove 
the, the thing that I called the easy way, that is just deploying univalence, is the same as, in the sense of the identity type, the thing that we wrote out laboriously by hand. So we can prove that when you write down this program using univalence, in fact, that's the same as if we had said, oh, well, you know, you send the multiplication to send the things over, do the multiplication, pull them back, et cetera. But there's not yet a notion of computation for which the hard way computes, the easy way computes to the hard way. We'd like it to be that sort of by a computer program, we automatically know that we don't have to do a proof ourselves. We just get computationally that when we write this down using univalence, we get the thing that we wrote out by hand. Okay? And the reason for that is that when we want to actually run a program that's written using univalence right now, it doesn't work. Programs get stuck. This property of canonicity that I talked about at the beginning of the talk fails. Okay? So we don't yet have the computational content of univalence, the way that you run a program using univalence nailed down. So that's kind of what we're working on, this idea of getting the short way of writing it to compute automatically to the long way of writing it. And we've made some progress on that. So in joint work with my PhD advisor, Bob Harper, we've proved this for a special case of what's called two-dimensional type theory. So I'm not going to have time to get into the technical conditions that explain why it's a special case. But it's essentially the simplest possible generalization of existing type theory to something where you get something, a limited case of univalence. And for that, we've shown how to get a computational interpretation where the uh, easy way computes to the hard way up to a notion of equational deduction. So it's not quite an algorithm in the theorem that we actually proved. Okay. But in progress, I think we now have an algorithm and we're working on verifying that the algorithm, in fact, does the right thing. And then one of the main goals for this special year, there's other people who are going to be working on this too, is solving this problem in general for full univalent type theory. So we'd like to get to the point where when you write down things using this generic idea that everything respects isomorphism, you can actually just run that as a program and see that you're getting what you would have written out by getting what you what what you would have written out by hand. Okay. So the main idea is that there's this cool interpretation of type theory in homotopy theory or category theory, and we're getting a lot of play out of it on sort of both all three directions, all however many directions of this, where the type theory lets you prove things about these semantics, and in turn, the semantics kind of suggest new logical principles like univalence to add to the type theory. Okay, thanks. <laughs>